Uh, so we're going to talk about managed packages and uh, how they're not just for ISVs. Um, I had a, when I submitted this talk, it was not such a fancy title. It was a lot more wordy and kind of uh, harder, easier to understand what the concept was, but not as flashy. So uh, you guys are all guinea pigs. This is the first time I've given this talk. So hopefully it goes great. It probably won't, um, but we'll, we'll roll with it. Um, so I first want to uh, thank our sponsors. Without them, this event wouldn't be happening. Um, I'm sure you guys have seen this slide before. Um, visit the sponsors out in the booth. We really appreciate their support. Go talk to them. They're uh, pretty good people. So let's talk about the, you know, the thousand foot view of what a managed package is if, you've, if you're not familiar with it. Um, how many people here have installed something from the App Exchange? Okay, you've used a managed package. Whether you've actually known it or not, those are all managed packages. Um, and they're self-contained bundles of objects, codes, record types, all the stuff that makes your, the packages work. It makes all the, the stuff from your ISVs and anything from the AppExchange work. Um, there are two types of managed packages. There's the AppExchange ones. Those are posted to the AppExchange. There's a review process you have to go through. Depending on the type of uh, package, you may have to pay money for it. Um, and those are what you would think of as an ISV package. Those are gonna be something that somebody's selling because they're putting money into it to get it on the app exchange. Um, unless it's a, like an open source project, you can get those up on free. But even that's a pain because you have to do a security review for those. Um, so that's, that's the, one, the one of the most popular type. But then there's also unlisted app exchange package or, un, or managed packages, which is the type I'm gonna be talking about today. You can write your own managed package and you'll have an installation link and it never shows up on the app exchange. Nobody will ever know how to install it except for you. Um, and so you can use it for yourself. So let's talk about why you would even want to you know, partake in such a silly thing. Um, this, these are reusable. Um, I work for Red Hat. One of our big things is we're an open source company. Uh, so that allows us to write a, a managed package that we think other people might find useful. It may not be. It's not worth putting money into to make it an actual, you know, product. Um, and so we put it out there in the community. We don't want to have to put it on the app exchange. We put it out there and other people might find it reusable. Or if you are, uh, are like us and have multiple orgs in a single, you know, company, we have got a sales org and a, uh, a support org. We've got a marketing org and we've got, I think we have four different orgs. Long story, find me afterwards and I will, I will t I'll tell you why. Um, a lot of it comes down to politics, but you know, we, have, we have them and that's you know, part of life is sometimes you get put in these uncomfortable positions. So you can use that same managed package across multiple orgs and you get the same functionality um, and you can have them inside your business and it's written, custom written just for you. Um, you get this separation of concerns. Uh, there are a lot of things that they live in their own little silo they may interact with standard Salesforce uh, objects and functionality, but that's all they do. They do one thing, and I'll talk about it and give you an example of what we do um, with ours, but they do one thing and they do one thing really well, and you don't need to interact with other stuff. So you can silo those off, and that way you can maintain, you know, if you wanna do a development team for just this one little feature, have them do that. It's a great way to get you know, newer devs in on something, give them a small chunk, they don't have to worry about the entire code base. Let's say you got like three million characters of code. That's really intimidating to somebody who's just coming in. But if you've got a managed package that they're working on, and there's only you know, 100 lines of code and two objects, that's much easier to kind of ease them into your workflow, to how you do things. Um, they're easy to update and deploy. Uh, it takes us to run all of our tests in our org, it takes eight hours. With the managed packages, because you've got much smaller chunks, that's easier, it's faster, and you can do these as one-offs. Um, like we have a process that we have to go through to release every three weeks. And with a managed package, if you do it right, I know I could push out an update and I can just go and click a button and install it <coughs> in my production org, you know, assuming I've done my tests and all my due diligence um, in a couple minutes. And so it's a lot faster for these small, again, sm siloed functions. And I'll talk about when not to use it in a little bit. Um, and like I said, they're fast to write and they're fast to update because they are small. You're doing smaller chunks and you, know, you, can, you can focus on just a little bit 
and you can run all those tests. The, the managed package that we have, says all the tests run in like two minutes, if that. Um, and so, you, you know, it's a lot faster to iterate over these things. Uh, one of the, the platform that I think a lot about is actually Python Lab, but is it kind of as fast as the one that they're implementing? I, I believe so. I don't, I don't know for certain. Um, I'm, unfortunately, I'm in the position where I'm unlimited user license, so you know, I, I don't hit a lot of these limits that a lot of people do. I believe it is. If, if anything else from the app exchange doesn't count towards your object limits, um, like you know, if you install TaskRate, they've got a bunch of objects underneath there. You know, that's, if that doesn't count towards the number of objects, then these managed packages wouldn't count. They, they are managed packages like everything else on the app exchange. It goes against the namespace. Yeah, it goes against the namespace limits. Uh, I don't know if professional orgs, e I don't believe so. <laughs> Uh, again, I don't know. No, so this is just, you know, kind of why in general there are, you know, depending on, again, what your licenses are, it may be slightly different for what you can use in your org. Um, you can create a company and build a org. Yeah, so, so that's, yeah, that's what we do, and I'll go into how we do it in a second, but, you know, we have a dev org that we spin up, and then we you know, have all the, the things but to be able to install it, you may not have all of the knobs and levers that the dev org does, so you gotta be aware of, or be aware of that. Uh, so, managed package requirements. Um, you want a developer org, not a sandbox. This is a brand new developer org that you go to, you know, developer.salesforce.com, and you click a new one, and you create it there. You don't wanna do it off sandbox, because you have to do namespaces, and Sandboxes are just not, you can't do it there. Um, you have to define a namespace. These are gonna be managed packages, so part of the managed packages is what's called a namespace, and that gets prefixed to all of your objects. If you've ever installed something from the App Exchange and you're looking at their objects, they have some name, double underscore, object name, that the stuff before the double underscore is the namespace. So that is going to be unique to your package. It's unique across all of the packages in Salesforce, all of the namespaces. So try to come up with a naming scheme that fits you. Um, ours are all RH underscore and then whatever we're doing. So they're kind of you know, unique to Red Hat. Um, and you know, pick something that is easy to, easy to use and easy to remember. I mean, you could technically just put in random characters and that would work as a namespace. But you know, that's hard to remember when you're trying to do object queries and things like this. Um, and you need something to deploy, right? I mean, you gotta have a reason to make it. I mean, yeah, you can make a managed package with nothing in it, but you know, why would you do that? Um, and like I said, App Exchange is not one of the requirements. You don't have to post on App Exchange. If you want to, you can. You know, if you have an open source project that you wanna make a managed package for, um, and, you don't want, and you can do that without paying any money, you do have to go through some additional hoops, some security reviews, um, by all means, do it, but you don't have to. Uh, and one of the great features that I love is that you can have packages in, uh, that depend on packages that depend on packages and you know all the way down the line. Um, so again, even more separation of concerns and allows you to use open source bases. So the thing I'm gonna demonstrate today, we have a, a managed package that is our open source version and then we extend that for our internal use that has fields that only we care about. So, I mean, you guys aren't gonna care about some of the fields that we have on these objects, but you know, we put in fields into the base object that most people might care about. Um, and then that way you can then extend it yourself and add additional fields to it. And the only requirement is when you install the child package, you install the parent package first, and then you install the child package. Um, and then you can do things like updating parts from separate from each other. So if you have uh, something in the base package you need to update, you don't have to update both, you can just update the base package. Um, we're going to demo, and unfortunately this is a bad setup for me because my back is going to be to you, and I hate that, so I apologize in advance. Um, so 
So let's take a look at this uh, GitHub. Uh, this is our escalations object. So again, I work for the support branch of Salesforce. And we have some escalations that come in. These are both from customers and from internals. So if a customer calls a salesperson and they're super angry, a salesperson can file an escalation with our support managers on a case and it gets paired to a case. And the support managers can then you know, reach out to the customer and make the problem right. Um, and so we wanted to kind of put this in its own thing to remove extra code from our code base. We have uh, we have 2.9 million characters of code, not including tests. We've got 9,400 9, 9, and some odd tests. It's a lot. We're trying to cut this crap down. And so by doing this, it allows us to um, put it into a managed package, and that is self-contained. Um, so this looks like any other uh, thing you would see, um, and it has all of the, the standard stuff. So let's look into the the actual uh, org, and this is not a very good layout because this monitor is tiny. Um, so I can see if I come into my objects in this org, well, let's first look at the very top. You can see here, this is developing a managed package. You'll get, once you've defined a namespace and you've actually started your first package, you'll see this little black box in the top right-hand corner, and that tells you what package you're working on. It's especially useful if you're switching between multiple orgs that have managed packages, because you can just look up there and say, oh, this is that package. Huh? No, this is, this is just a straight up developer edition fam or org. Okay, I did not know that. I've never used DSM. <laughs> um, and so uh, I can, we'll look in briefly at some objects because this is a shorter session and I don't want to run long. <sighs> really? So if we look at some objects, we can see that I have got escalation, that's going to be our base object, escalation case, that is a pairing between an escalation and a case. Uh, escalation comment is a, a, a comment for an escalation, and then escalation team that pairs contacts and users to an escalation. Um, and you'll see that there's this uh, little icon next to it, um, and that means that it is part of a managed package. So if you wanted to set up things to test, you can have additional objects um, in here that are not part of your managed package, um, and you can certainly do that, but when they have been released and added to a managed package, that little icon will show up. Um, there is a great trailhead for doing managed packages. I recommend you look over that if you, if you want more. This is just a very fast, high-level uh, look at it. Um, when we actually look at the object, we can see our namespace for the object, or for the package, I mean. This is the RHSCAL package. Um, and we can see what has been released. Um, and so these are all the fields and Apex classes um, and page layouts and what versions they were released, and I'll show you versions here in a moment. Um, and this is everything that when a person installs this in an org, this is everything that comes along with it. Now, uh, with managed packages, you cannot access the code outside um, of the managed package. I'll put a little asterisk there and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and you can't access some of the other bits outside of it. You can access all the data, you can query those objects, you can interact with them. Um, but things, anytime you go into code, um, it gets obfuscated and uh, you don't see debug logs for that. So uh, there, it is slightly different when you're running a managed package. Um, but you know, the, the data is still there and it's still available. Um, and then if we look, so, so this is the package. Um, and that brought me to this page here. And I meant to go to versions. So let's look at versions. The way that you update a package, um, really? Version. Um, the way that you update a package is you can, uh, when you have new things, you can uh, click in, uh, I think it's upload. I have to remember, it's been a while since I've actually made changes. 
but you will define the version number and version name. Um, the version numbers have to be in the form of single dig uh, digit dot digit. Um, you can't have any characters in there, so you can't do like 1.1.1 1 .1 .1 or 1.1a or any of that stuff. They have to be actual numbers. Um, and then you can mark them as betas. Um, I recommend not using the betas, um, especially if you're the only one using it. The betas are a pain in the butt to deal with. They're a pain to upgrade from. Um, if you're the only one using it, just make it a, a regular release and you can have as many of these version numbers as you want. So if you're, if you're testing it out in the first time, it's okay if it doesn't make it to our actual production org until it's version like 1.11. You know, just, you know, iterate over this. Like you can see here, we didn't actually install it in our production org until 1.1. So we put it in the sandboxes before to test it and we found, oh, we missed something or, oh, this didn't quite work how we wanted it to. So we added additional ones. Um, you can install them in production. Yeah. So, and, and then again, going from the beta to an official is a different step and it's just, it's not worth the headache. De depends on what you're developing. Yeah. So yes, always test your managed package in a sandbox prior to deploying it to your production. Right. But yeah. if you are doing something like um, some trigger logic, for example, that you're writing or um, if you're a process builder or something, it may not make sense to make it in a managed package oh. if it doesn't stand alone. Yeah. Um, so the biggest thing is it needs to stand alone. If you're interacting with fields in your org that are not standard fields, you're going to have a hard time because this, they just won't know about it, right? Your, your data structure in here are going to be all the standard fields and standard objects. Um, so that's, again, why, you know, you, this is all self-contained. There's only those four objects, and that's all that we deal with. And we do we reach out to case, but it is case ID. It is a standard field, and it's just a standard related lookup. Um, and uh, then we have our Red Hat escalations. This is our implementation version of the package, and this one is going to have a timed out as well. Um, and we can see that this one is named space. We, we have gone with the structure of IMPL or implementation. So this is our implementation of the Red Hat Escalation package. Um, and if we look at this, it's a much smaller um, of an actual package. All that's on it is some custom fields um, that we have um, and then some, uh, some additions to some uh, other classes, some additional classes. Um, when I was talking about accessing code earlier, um, you can reach into managed packages to access code if they are flagged as global. So if you have a global class with a global method, you can use that. So that's really useful if you have, um, let's say you've got some custom APIs that you're writing in your main org, you can reach into utility classes in your package to query things and you can maintain all your business logic in one location in the code inside your managed package and then reach in and call methods. Um, does that make sense? Um, another example of, of where, we're, where we are using this is we have our, and I don't have this prepped because I literally started on it on Saturday. Um, we're using this in our sales org uh, to ex display data from our service org without having to do Salesforce to Salesforce or Lightning Connect or anything like that. We have APIs that are available through a uh, SSO login that our sales reps have access to. Um, and we're going to write a Visual Force page that makes REST calls to our API to fetch case data and create escalations and do things like that 
So that way our salespeople, their developers don't have to know about our APIs. Their developers don't have to waste their time by you know, doing our stuff and we can have, you know, build a little bit of uh, goodwill with that team by saying, here, all you have to do is install this package and then add a button that links to that Visual Force page. And you, we can add things like URL parameters to say this is the account number that we're looking at. And then you've got a customized Visual Force page in there that shows data to them. And that's, you know, something you can do without having to have them write the code in their org just hand it to them. And then if you have a bug or you want to add new features, you update the managed package and say, here's the new link. They click a button, they update it, and you're essentially an ISV to your own company. Um, so you get that kind of chance to provide these uh, you know, packages to other orgs inside of your company. So there are some caveats. Um, there are some global limits for non-certified packages. I don't remember exactly um, what size limits they are. They are fairly large and the non-certified are like you have to be a partner to have more than a certain number of objects in a managed package. Again, if you're doing this the way that we are, you're looking at small, concise stuff. So you're not going to have or you shouldn't have a thousand objects in this managed package. Um, you know, that's that doesn't seem, that doesn't scale well with this kind of small modular approach. There are limits on the number of namespaces that can operate on a single object in a trigger context. So if you have, if you wanted to write a, an account trigger in your managed package and you've got, I think there are, t I think it's 10. If you have 10 other managed packages that have triggers on the account object, you will get a, an error with a namespace limit and you're done. Um, and you can't roll back managed packages. You have to move forward. So if you have a bug in your managed package, you have to release a new version that then you install the new version to fix that bug. So that's part of the reason why testing is important in your um, orgs. You can jump. You can jump from 1.2 to 1.7, and that's no problem. Um, so you can jump versions of managed packages, but you want to make sure that you know, you can't go back from 1.3 to 1.2 because you found a bug. So test it in your sandboxes, you know, test it outside, just test, test, test. Um, like I said, there is a trailhead for ISV app development. It goes over how to create managed packages. It goes over um, some of the rules and how to use them in other orgs. Um, I have created a couple of blog posts about managed packages. These are a lot around uh, REST services inside of managed packages. This is, um, again, how to use code from other managed packages um, and uh, some other caveats and you know, how to create child managed packages. And then if you want this presentation, it's available uh, on my GitHub, um, pecan.github.io slash presentation, and it's listed there, um, or at least I hope it is. I thought I, I think I put it up there. If it's not, it'll be up there by Monday. Um, I'll, I'll make sure that it's up there. So questions. Do I have a question slide? Oh, okay. I didn't know if I had a question slide, but there you go. This will be my question slide and you guys can ask questions and copy stuff down. Correct. So you would have to, if the question was, if I have multiple developers and I have a managed package, how do I, essentially, how do I let other people m develop that managed package? So you, again, you don't put these on sandboxes. You put them on developer edition orgs. And developer edition orgs do allow you to have two users. Um, so you would have to either share credentials for that or swap that around or do continuous integration and continuous deployment where they are deploying directly to that managed package org. There's a talk about that later today. Um, <laughs> yes, I, I'm pitching, <laughs> pitching a talk for him. 
Um, and they actually do a lot with managed packages, so it uh, should be an interesting thing to go see. But you know, you would have to do that. Um, you can probably work with your, your Salesforce folks and maybe get additional users added to uh, a developer edition org for this type of thing. Um, but that's, again, going to be up to Salesforce's discretion. You could do that. Um, you could have them developed in sandboxes and then push to a developer org and manage it as a package. That flow to me doesn't feel very right because you are, you're developing against everything and you're not developing in its own little you know, silo. So it's something you could make a, a, an incorrect assumption that was in your package and then you push it to the packaging org and it's not there. You can also And again, when you're getting to that many developers on a single package, mm -hmm. um, you're getting outside of scope of this type of thing. You're getting more into the, the I guess, ISV type realm of, of how the, the workflow would be. Okay. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.